okay? Good. Uh, let's pray for uh, uh, our, our folks down in Florida right now. Uh, Father, uh, sometimes we live in perilous times. and Father, sometimes that uh, perilous times would be uh, bad choices that we make maybe as a whole country, as individuals. Lord, also we know perilous times comes because our uh, world has been cursed because of the, our fall and rebellion against God. And uh, hurricanes and cyclones and volcanoes, they're always going to be with us as a reminder, uh, Lord, that we've left the, the paradise uh, where we were protected and, and, and had fellowship with you, perfect fellowship. And uh, now we serve those consequences, Lord. But every day there's an opportunity to share the gospel, and maybe this will be an opportunity for many uh, Christians and, and uh, fellow believers to uh, come to the aid of those, uh, Father, that and humanity that we love. And so, Father, we pray uh, your watchful eyes and uh, speedy recovery, Lord, at this time. We just thank you for loving us, and thank you for this opportunity to be around your word uh, this morning as your people. This is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. If you turn your Bibles to James, the fourth chapter, we're going to look at uh, the first ten verses. In a few minutes, we'll look at verses one through five. Uh, so James, chapter four, the first ten verses. Uh, the theme this morning is... Uh, God desires to draw near to us, and uh, it's in God's nature to do that. And, uh, but it is the, f the reason why he wants to draw near is to not only save us, but help us through the life that we live uh, here in this world. And so uh, repeat after me. This is a part of, uh, you're going to have a memory verse this morning. I'm going to help you memorize it. Uh, say with me, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God. And he will draw near to you. Let's do it again. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. That's part of verse 8, the very first part of verse 8 there when we, when we get there. As I look back through my Christian life, I, you know, in my, in my life uh, before I was a Christian, uh, there's many special times, good times, fun times, VBS and college, and, and uh, that was a good time, and family camp, and... Uh, just, I think, one of the great rewards of life is, you know, has been in, in ministry and, and being here uh, for, for 20-some years. And, uh, but what makes those times fulfilling, what makes them really fun, what makes the excitement so great is the close fellowship we have with God and the fellowship we have with each other. Uh, that makes the difference. God made us that way, uh, that we're be, to be a brotherhood, we're to be a family, that we have this fraternal love, this uh, agape love and friendship love uh, that makes us close. So my fondest memories is because of that closeness with God and closeness with His people, but also my family. But before I found God, I had a really close relationship with my dad. Uh, we were a young family, and uh, but my father, was, was a possibility he would die young at just 42 years old. And uh, we had such a close relationship. We had long talks, and just we were passionate about life when we got together. And so we had a deep relationship and if my father would have died I felt like there was no reason for me to live and uh and, and that's that's tough when you're just a, a teenager and uh to, to think that way but that's how I felt and I think because we were bonded uh because of our relationship because of communication we forged a closeness together and I felt lost you know without him and so uh, God made us that way didn't he to be intimate and close and uh, when mom and I we were both converted uh, the same year 1982 in the early 80s and uh, we had an hour drive back and forth from church. And during that time, we just grew together because we watched God move in our life and teach us about him. And we didn't know very much about the Bible at that time. As we were learning, we had love around us and people shared with us. And we became very, very close. As a matter of fact, we got so close, she lives with me now. And uh, so that shows that the Lord works and uh, all the way from back then. But we had a special relationship because God designed us that way to draw near to each other, to draw near to Him. He unfolded a whole new life for us, didn't He? And uh, our life, if you knew Mom's life and my life before we became Christians, you'd say, thank God too, that He showed us a new way. So God created us in His image. God is relational, we're relational. He wants us to be able to be close and draw near. And He's a God who calls us near to Him. All through Scripture, He urges us to come near. Because we have a struggle, don't we? The world pulls us this way. God's calling us this way towards Him. And the world is knocking all the time, isn't it? In so many ways. As a matter of fact, it's hard to keep up. 
And, uh, but we're not, we don't have to keep up with the world, but yet it keeps calling us closer and closer. God created us in His image. He wants to be near. He made us that way. He wants to show us through life. He doesn't want the world to show us through. He doesn't use our own thinking. He wants us to be liberated from that. Here in James, in, the, in this chapter, beginning part of this chapter, with his own eyes, he sees the church and new Christians struggling between the world and God. The world and God is pulling on them. The world philosophy of the time. World philosophy today is pulling on us, isn't it? And he saw the struggle. And so he wants us to understand the struggle. You know, James is a hard hitter, isn't he? Man, he hits you right between the eyes. He tells you exactly what's going on. And so, but, but the point of his directness, we'll see here as we get to the later verses, is he knows the formula for pulling us out of the rut or pulling us out of the influence of the world. But notice how he describes it. This is a good time for us to take an inner look, sort of an inventory. It's a time to be honest. Anytime we open the Bible, we should be that way, shouldn't we? We say, God, sift through me. David even challenges God as he comes through his repentant life and he gets things straightened out. He said, God, test me. Know that I'm trying to live right for you. Listen to what James says here. What is the source of your quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source of your pleasures that wage war in your members? He answers the question for us. Isn't it the pleasure that pulls you into conflict and the quarrels? You lust and you do not have. So you commit murder. And most of the time that murder's in your mind. Because he says here, you are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulterers, he's saying you've simply broke covenant with God for the sake of your pleasures. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Yes. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy to God. James shoots straight, doesn't he? Or do you not think that the Scriptures speak for no purpose? So James is saying, hey, why do you think God gave us His Word? Why do you think He preserved it? Why do you think He wants you to read it? Why do you think He put in the middle of the Bible Psalm 119 to say over and over again the value of His Word for you to read? It has a purpose. It has an effect. It has a drive. It convicts us and it strengthens us. He says it has a purpose. And listen to what he says next. God jealously desires the spirit, spirit which He has made to dwell in you. So not only does the Word have a purpose, He reminds us that He gave us the indwelling of His own Spirit within us. And it says there that He has a jealousy for that Spirit to walk with His Spirit. But when we're caught up and we say, why so much conflict? Why quarreling? Why do I envy so much that I wish that guy would drive his car into a telephone pole? In our mind. Why do we ask with wrong motives? Well, James nails it right here. and He says, because we're friends with the world. Don't we see conflict all around us? And it's a godless world. People are blinded by this world. And they're going 100 miles an hour. And there's quarrels and conflicts and fights all the time. So as guys, you know, there's a big traffic jam. You know, they're on 97, a terrible accident. And one guy calls to uh, Jeremy and says, hey, are you a police officer? His car looks like that. Somebody had swiped his car and kept on going. But James here is talking to the church. He says, in the church there's conflicts and quarrels and there's lust and there's murder in our minds and there's asking God with wrong motives and that's why we don't receive. See, the world says it's all about me. It's my rights. It's my feelings, my pleasures. I, me, my. And uh, most of you haven't been around long enough to know. Remember George Harrison's song, I, me, my? Remember that? I mean my, I mean my, I mean my. And the song is sickening because it's night and day. I mean my, and morning and evening. And everywhere you go, I mean my. It's about I mean my, all about you. 
How can I be in a relationship with somebody when it's all about you? So he got it. And that's what worldliness is. It plays right into the devil's hands, doesn't it? Because he wants to steal your time from God. He wants to steal your money from the church. He wants to take your interest away from God. You see, the devil wants us to be friends with him. He wants to steal away our relationship with the Lord. You see, the devil knows that friendship with the world disconnects us from God. It takes us from his spirit and a relationship, close relationship with him. Remember, it said that God is jealous for his spirit that dwells in you. So it's a pure and a loving, jealous desire that God has to be close in fellowship with us. That is the key to coming out of worldliness. When it begins to just overtake us, and sometimes we don't even know, we just realize, you know, why do I keep watching this stuff? Why do I get angry so easy? Why is there quarreling at work and nobody's getting along? And why is it creeping to the church? It's our focus, isn't it? Through James this morning, God is asking, who is your friend? Because friendship takes time and investment, doesn't it? He's asking, is it me or is it the world? So here's verses 6 through 10. It will help us make up our minds. So help number one, as we look through this, is the fact that God is jealous. He desires a relationship with us to draw near. Draw near to God, James says, he'll draw near to you. Say it with me. Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. You see, it's in God's nature. Didn't he first love us? Isn't that John what John instructed us? God first loved us. Love wants friendship. Love wants relationship. Love wants to be close. You know, it's natural in children, isn't it? All children are like this. Mommy and daddy give each other a hug, and the child wants in on it, don't they? They want to squeeze in. You see, we named it a cookie hug. You see, they're the cream in the Oreo. And uh, they get in between us, and we just hug them. And don't children just love that? But also, they're jealous for our undivided love, aren't they? And, uh, and I know this is true for Rick because uh, Piper does this at our house. When you begin to give her attention and play with her and everything, she follows you everywhere you go. You go out the door, she's like, hey! And uh, at first she says, bye-bye, bye-bye, because it's something new, right? Then after a while, it's like, they're actually leaving now, and I don't have somebody to follow around and play with. But see, kids are jealous for our attention and our love, aren't they? You know it's always been that way for God? If you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3-8, it says there, as Adam and Eve were in the garden, and uh, it says there in verse 8, <clears throat> uh, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And this is after they hid themselves because they had sinned, and now they feel ashamed. The innocence is gone. The cool of the day here is the idea when work is over and dinner is complete, and it's that sort of uh, uh, pleasantry time to talk together. And that's when God comes close. That's when God comes near. He came to draw near to connect with Adam and Eve because that's his nature and that is our nature to be able to do that. And uh, how many like send sunsets? And I just, I love sunsets. And Judy and I always love to come over here because the field is nice and open, just beautiful sunsets here at the church. And, uh, but sunsets are special, aren't they? They kind of open the door, don't they? To praise God and then just to talk and have conversation. You see, it was the end of the day, and that's how it was for God. That's how he felt about Adam and Eve. But it wouldn't take long for that separation to take place. Matter of fact, that would be the moment. But in this moment, where God knew that now they would know the separation from God, they wouldn't have that close walk, they wouldn't have that sunset evening, they wouldn't have the, 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 the questions and answers that they need from God personally right there with him in their midst. They didn't realize what was coming, but God did. But even though that moment would be lost, God preordained that very day as he prophesied about what would happen, the curse of the earth and curse of man, the curse of woman, but then the devil himself would be knocked out by Jesus many years later. God would prophesy, he would know that he would want, wanted to be back in fellowship with man. And so God's still the same today. He wants to walk with us in the cool in the evening when nothing else has our attention. Or in the morning when we first walk, wake up, he wants to be there. 
I don't think there's a better passage in Scripture that helps describe how close God is and wants to be near to us. If you would turn to Psalms 139. It's a very popular psalm today because it deals with the problem that we have with abortion, not realizing that God was consciously aware and had already designed your person before you were even conceived. But notice in these first six verses here of Psalm 139, notice how God wants to be near and how it defines that for us. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down. You know when I rise up. You understand my thoughts from afar. You scrutinize my path, my lying down. You are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word was on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot obtain to it. We can't either, can we? It is amazing how near God actually is. As a matter of fact, before there's a prayer, before you come into God's presence, He's already searched your heart. He already knows the troubles there. He already knows the emptiness that may be there. He may know the loneliness that is there. He may know the, the, the a mistake you're about to make. And He'd love to head it off. He knows your conscious thoughts. He knows the intention of your heart maybe before you do. So nothing's hidden from Him. It's an absolute transparent moment when you come to God. The problem is we're not coming. The problem is we're not there enough. The problem is we get more time over here than more time over here with Him. And so we lose that opportunity for that transparent relationship, for that openness that we need to draw near to Him. He's always ready. Draw near to God, He'll draw near to you. He's ready to draw near. And He's ready, as it says here, to search us. That means intimacy, doesn't it? That means I, I want to know what's in your heart. I want to know your plans. I want to know your goals. I want to know what's troubling you. And he wants to know because he wants to guide us. And they say in um, verse 5 there, it says he's behind, before, and in front. He see, he surrounds us. If you want to go this way, he knows it's the wrong way, what's he do? He said, back up. He'll put a roadblock back up. Now, a lot of times, we'll just go right through it, won't we? He's saying, back up. You turn this way, it's the wrong way, back up. He doesn't want us to go that way. And it doesn't matter where we are, in our walk, what we're doing, on the job, in a relationship, He is around, in front, and before. And He's aware where you're going. He knows the direction. In successful marriages, couples reach a high level of trust because they learn the value of openness and transparency. That's God's message today. That openness and transparency unlocks the door for a closeness and a nearness that we need. Look at verse 2. It says there, you know me when I sit down, when I rise. You understand my thoughts from afar. God knows our every move. He knows when you're going to make it before you make it. He knows every situation that we're in. But also, he understands uh, what we're going to do and why we're going to do it. We're not always understood down here, are we? And uh, even the people who love us the most. And uh, but God understands completely, and He takes that knowledge and He does what's right for you. That is, if we're in communication with Him and we're asking Him. Remember, it says there in the first part of James, "You ask and you don't receive because you're asking wrong." You're asking for your will, for your pleasures, for for things to work out for you. But God may want something to work for you that's uncomfortable that's going to help somebody else. Hasn't he ever put you in a job that you didn't like, but yet there was somebody who needed Jesus? Yeah. Uh, I took a job way back uh, when Judy and I uh, uh, were first married and everything, went up to Connecticut, and uh, I had to get a job for the summertime, remodel her mom's house for her to to sell it and everything. And... uh, this job that I took on, the guy, the boss, was brutal. I mean, nobody wanted to work there once you get there after the first day you figure out, you know. Nobody wants to work for this guy, you know. And I was stuck with that. But, man, there were two people who were looking for Jesus that summer. God put it there. 
Now, I didn't like it, but man, there was something for God that he wanted to, to accomplish. Look at verse 3. You scrutinize my path, my lying down. You're intimately acquainted with all my ways. See, God's not only all-knowing, and he knows everything that's happening in your heart and your mind, and he knows the pretense of your heart, and he knows decisions you're going to make. It says here, he thinks it over. He scrutinizes what you're doing. That's really caring, isn't it? That's like, I was reading an article the other day, and I tried to practice it when I went home with my wife. And that is, you know, we've heard this before, learn to listen. But, but, but listening is also not hearing the words that are coming out that are just right there, the actual words. But under words, there's something else. There's in between the person's personality, uh, their, their temperament, the uh, way they feel right now in that place and in that moment. And so listening is observing and hearing the words. You follow what I'm saying? God's got that down. See, he's thinking about what you're doing and what you're about to do. And then based on that, he comes behind, around, in front, and he wants to guide you. That's what God wants to do. He wants to be near and close to that degree. Now listen how David feels about that. He understands, wow, this is amazing. So he's sort of like a kid's going to say, all right, I'm going to find out, God. I'm going to run over here. I'm going to run over there. I'm really going to see if you're there and you know what's going on. So listen to what he says. Start in verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit? Say nowhere. Say nowhere. You can go nowhere. You can go nowhere from God's spirit. So if you decide to walk into the dark, he's there. That means you're making a bad decision. You're doing something you know God doesn't want you to do. It says your spirit is there. The wind just flipped it over. Or where can I flee from your presence? Say nowhere. If I ascend into heaven, you're there. Don't say nowhere. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you're there. So he's saying, look, descend to heaven. I know you're going to be there. You're not going to be in Sheol, are you? Yes, he is. Because in God there's no darkness and evil cannot influence God. He can go to Sheol. Go ahead. Many times we run towards hell. Don't we? He says, I'm there. If I take the wings of the dawn, isn't that beautiful? Wouldn't you like to do that? Judy's always told me she wants to fly. So I know when we're in heaven, I'm going to watch her. There she goes. Uh, anytime we went to North Carolina, she would get on one of those, uh, what was it called? Parasails. You know, 1,500 feet. And I'm like, she's a little dot now. And uh, will, she, will my wife return? That's what I was thinking. If I take the wings of the dawn, wouldn't that be nice? Sun rises, and now you're flying as far as you want. You're just seeing the creation of God. You're saying, wow, he's here. It's his creation. He's with me. If I dwell in remote parts of the sea, Jonah knows about that, doesn't he? Even there your hand will lead me, and your right hand will lay hold of me. And so King David's saying, it doesn't matter where I go. You know, you know my thoughts and you think about me, you're acquainted with all my ways, you know I can't run from you. Didn't Jonah try to do that? He tried to run from God. So McKenna and Taylor were starting new schools this morning, both, I mean this year, up in Pennsylvania, and the, the girls were apprehensive, and their mother told Judy that they were. So Judy sent them a card, and uh, it was to comfort them, comfort their fears, and let them know we love them, and we're praying for them, and we're thinking about them. It's almost like we were walking with them to school that morning. And that's what God is saying He wants to do with us. He wants us to know how near He is and how close He wants to be. Whether you're driving your car or going to work, whether you're coming to a household that's just full of quarrel and conflict, and He knows everything's happening, He's saying, I'm right there with you. And I want to comfort you and bring you along. I want you to deal with grief. I, want you, I don't want you to be by yourself. I want you to know that you're not alone. So he wants us to, he, he, we're compelled to draw near to him. So this morning it's like he just wrote us a card. Psalm 139, just a reminder. But he wants to be near. He wants us to understand that he understands, that he cares. 
He's waiting for us to draw near. Now, I don't think you could prove the nearness of God more than through Jesus Christ himself. It says of him there in Matthew 1.23, Jesus is called Emmanuel, which translated God with us. And indeed, Jesus was with us, wasn't he? He was with the 12. He was with probably 120 people in all for three full years. It says there in John 1.14, the word was God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Three full years. Every day, 24-7, Jesus was there with the 12. But at least up to 120 people by the time we get down to Acts. I would have loved to have been 120, wouldn't you? 120, that would be fine. Didn't that be Peter, Paul, or the rest? But maybe 120. Be with Jesus. See him in the flesh. That's how close he wanted to be. And it just wasn't on the Sabbath. It just wasn't on Wednesday's suppers. It was every day, all the time, he was with them. You know, I'm not with my wife for 30 years that much. I take a break and go to work. And she has her thing. You, everybody has their thing, don't they? But Jesus was with them continually. Uh, how many have been camping? Raise your hand. How many have been around a campfire? See, that's all the rest of you. Yeah, you see, if you've never been around a campfire, what world are you living in? But anyway, campfires are cool, aren't they? they, they you know, they're the highlight of camping. They've always been the highlight of camping for me. I just love that time. And uh, I'm a little bit like... Um, a cow over there who likes to be around people. And, uh, and, and Rick's the same way, so you got a, a triple dose. But anyway, hot dogs, you know, roasting hot dogs, s'more, storytelling, um, uh, tele the game telephone guessing games, uh, charades. You know, but when the night falls and the ambers are burning, isn't it that time just to let your hair down? It's the time where you talk and converse and tell stories and get close and intimate to people that you camp with. And uh, we did that for years with the Connors, and we have a bond. We even have a picture book, you know, of those times. And uh, can you imagine? I got this little picture here that Sylvia gave me that's hanging in the office, and it's the 12 with Jesus, and they're around the campfire. And can you imagine an all day of ministry, and just about every night, you get to sit around a campfire with the Lord? I think it's that place where Jesus asked a very intimate question. And so they're, they're feeding thousands, they're healing, and, uh, but Jesus starts teaching. And the sayings, it says, were getting hard. And the people were leaving. Healed uncles and aunts and children. Bellies all nice and full, and they're leaving. And now they're sitting around the campfire. And Jesus says to the twelve, and maybe a few more, Are you going to leave me too? You remember Peter's words? What a moment at the campfire. Here's what he says. To whom shall we go? You have the words of life. They can, a whole world can leave and reject Jesus. We're staying right here. We found the nearness of God. We're staying right here. You see, the world's calling you away from that intimacy, isn't it? It's calling us away with so many things, especially technology. And we're missing that moment when Jesus says, are you going to leave too? Are you going to leave too? Let's be like Peter. No, no, no. I don't care how stimulating it gets. No. I don't care how much persecution comes. No. You have the words of life. And we're staying with you. How close did John get to Jesus? I mean, he felt so comfortable. We're talking about the last moments. Jesus is teaching him a lot of things in those last hours at the Last Supper. Things that are hard to hear, like I got to go. I got to leave. But I have to because you're going to even be closer to God because the Holy Spirit's going to come and dwell in you. So I got to go. It was tough. They said, you're going to be arrested. I'm going to drink a cup of death. You are too. At some point in time. Not the same cup I'm dying for you. You're going to die for me too, but not for your sin. It was a tough time. But John could lay right here on Jesus' side. You have a friend like that? You have a spouse like that? Yeah. She can lay your head there. Comfort. And John could do that. 
You see, Jesus wasn't an ivory tower, was he? He wasn't, oh, you know, keep that dust away from me. Oh, keep that smell from me. Oh, keep, keep them children, them loud children away from me. No, he invited them, didn't he? Oh, he said, stop it. Let them come around here. Could you see the kids jumping on, the, on God? <laughs> they were jumping on God. He's like, yeah, come on. He wasn't saying, line up right there, children, shoulder to shoulder, and behave yourselves. <laughs> Get that slobber off your chin. No, he played with them, didn't he? So um, I brought these little bears here. Is Piper here? Anyway, I don't want her to see these. But when Piper comes into our house, she, uh, she goes for these bears, and they're sitting on a basket uh, with all the other tools, but she grabs these first. And um, I know how much she's loved and how affectionately she's loved by what she does with these bears. She may, I'll try to sound like Rick because this is what she, what she does, what Rick does to her. And she rolls on the floor and she takes these bears. But here's the amazing thing that she does next. She brings them over to you. And she sets them on your lap. And then she stands back like this with this look. Little bears. And she just glows. She's, yeah. What is she doing? The most natural thing. The same thing God does. I want you to feel the love that I feel. That I give to these bears because somebody gave it to me. And that's God. James says, draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. And your worldliness will begin to disappear. And you'll say, this is so much better. And I think sometimes we need kids to wake us up. To see the innocence of love. See, God is, he is almighty. But he's relational and caring. And he wants to come near. He shows us sometimes through little kids. Better be careful with these. Here's a better translation of verse 5. The Spirit of God, which He made to dwell in us, jealously desires us. So God's Spirit who indwells us wants us. See, He wants us from the inside because that's where everything begins from your actions on the outside, the inside. And so He desires to walk with our spirit. Paul makes it very clear in Romans chapter 8. You walk by the Spirit, you won't fulfill the things of the flesh. That's Galatians. But if you walk by the flesh, it means death. You walk by the Spirit, it's life and peace with God. And that's exactly what he wants. When we're friends with the world, our loyalties are divided. God wants you to be in his Spirit and walking with him. In the prodigal son, in Luke chapter 15, verse 20, Jesus, through that whole chapter, is trying to help us how, see how God feels about our lostness. He wants us to know that God celebrates when something that is lost is found. We're like that too, aren't we? Uh, the other day, um, uh, Kelly, she put her phone down. We were over at the depot getting food, right? Uh, Chuck and, 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 and uh, Mary Jo... And uh, we're getting food and everything. And she had put her phone down. And we went on and did some other stuff. Because she went and climbed up on the shelf. And all of a sudden, when she realized it was gone, it's a panic, right? <gasps> where could it be? We thought, okay, it's got to be back where you climbed the shelves, right? We're running back there. And uh, so I was blocking her way. And I saw it. And she didn't see it. She thinks it, it wasn't there. But I picked it up. Oh, man, wow. It's found. It's found. You know what I'm talking about. So but God's talking about souls. He's talking about finding your soul that has wandered off, pulled by the world. Remember the prodigal? He prostituted himself. He spent all his money, ended up in a pig cage, and finally says, you know, I need to go back to my father. I need to reconcile with him. I need forgiveness. I need to be restored. And here's the very words of the father 
in there in Luke 15, 20. But while he, the son, was afar off, while he was still a long way off, it says, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. See, the moment he saw him, far off, it almost sounds like he was maybe every day, maybe going like this, looking. And there he is, like a little pea. And he sees him. And the first thing he feels is compassion. He could have said, I told you so. Or he could have said, oh, no, you're to come crawling back home for your stuff. No, he celebrated, didn't he? He was happy he came back home. He understood what lostness means. He understood what it means when the world grabs a hold of you and just takes everything. Separates you from God's nearness and closeness and blessings. So Jesus here, he tells these stories to impress upon us that God wants us to change and come back to him. Draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. Number two help in this passage. We must be willing to draw near to God. James gets pretty hard on us again, but notice his words. Draw near to God. I'm starting with uh, verse 6. But he gives a greater grace. Therefore it says, God is opposed to the proud but he gives grace to the humble. Submit therefore to God. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. Draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep and let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. Humble yourself in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. This means that we're willing to take an inventory of our heart right now. In these words, we're willing to say, all right, Lord, I'm paying attention now. I realize there's a weakness. I realize the world has sort of pulled me away. But he also says this, that pride will ignore this message. That pride will ignore God's word. That pride will say, ah, ah, whatever. Pride will shut our ears down and close our heart. You will leave here unchanged. You'll go back and do the same thing you've done, the same pattern day after day, and really in your misery. Because you know you're not really happy and there's an emptiness inside. You'll go back to your own desires, to the world's offerings, and it's offering today like it never has before. It's 24-7. It says that God opposes the proud. So you'll continue to be friends with the world. It says there is hostility towards God. It's against his nature. He doesn't want us to be worldly. Because in essence, we're rejecting his spirit within us. That which is intimate with us, that's what draws close to him. Now notice there in verse 7. <clears throat> Submit therefore to God. Submit means this. Get back to him. Obey Him, read His Word, pray, spend time with Him, meditate on His Word. That means you're going to replace the time that you're spending on yourself. Submit. Submit. Comply. To who? God. God's Word. See, what happens is we get away from the Word because we've already got in a foot in the world. we got a foot here. So it cancels out time with God. And prayer. Uh, prayer is harder than reading it. Who say, I hear, I've read the whole Bible. <laughs> but have you talked to God while you're reading it? Are you asking Him what He wants to clean up? What He wants to straighten out? What He wants to do in that very minute? And then it says, resist the devil. And what's it say He'll do? He'll take off. He'll take off. If we... Make a decision, resist. So when it's right in front of you, the other, last week or a couple of weeks ago, Rick talked about the moral man. And the moral man, the upright man, will press that button when the temptation of immorality comes. We're tempted by immorality, says the man with integrity will push the button that says no, that ejects the devil's temptation. And he's saying right here, you're a Christian, you can say no anytime you want. 
It's your way of escape. When temptation comes, just say no. We know how to say no, don't we? So one big, I'm going to say one, two, three, say no as loud as you can. One, two, three. Thanks, Jeremy. That was good. That was good. So he says, resist. That's all you got to do is resist, and then the devil will run. You see, when, when it talks about him being a roaring lion, he's waiting to devour somebody, and uh, you take the nature of a lion, and the lion always goes after the slowest and the weakest of the, in, in the, in the, in the um, herd, you know. But, so the devil is going to try to do it when you are weak. But if you're submitting to God, you won't be weak. Then it's easier to push the button and say, out of here. I spent time with God this morning. I've been in His Word. And He said, don't do it. So he just said, no, resist. He says, clean your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. See, sin is on our hands. But it does start with our heart. And so the problem is, is in my, are my hands serving and worshiping? Do I lift up holy hands to God? Or did I use it all for me? So he said, clean them. Clean them off. And um, I like dishwashing liquid. It cleans your hands better than anything else. And Judy doesn't know that's why it goes so low so fast. But I, I like dishwashing liquid. It really does clean. But I tell you, confession really cleans your hands. And James says, clean your hands, you sinners. <laughs> Is there any doubt we're sinners? After you read James, you know it. You sinners, you know. Purify your hearts. Isn't that what King David needed? He knew after his adulterous affair, after losing a child, bringing a child in this world, and having to lose that child, that child never having a chance to live, and maybe being the greatest king Israel ever knew, die. He knew his heart was a mess. He said, give me a new one. God, can we completely start from scratch? New. Clean. That's what he asked for. Purify my heart. Because here's the problem. When those folks there that James was talking about, which happens to run across all the centuries to us, when he observed that they took a walk in the world and weren't coming back, he knew they had to get serious about what they were doing, and he called it double-mindedness. In other words, you think, over here I can come and worship God and praise Him and read a couple paragraphs of His Word, but over here, boy, I can go and see an R-rated movie. He calls that double-mindedness. That's hypocritical, isn't it? Here's what he says. He wants us to be serious about his, our relationship with him. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. That just tells me God wants us to get serious about this subject, worldliness. He wants us to draw near to him. That's the answer. There isn't a person sitting in this room right here who doesn't know what that means. How to draw near to God. And now in your hearing, you know that God wants to draw near to you. That starts to win over the world and its pull on us. But we've got to get serious. David was in sackcloth and ashes for a whole week. That means he was down on his face and he was in darkness. He was covered and. Not maybe during that time, but he got up and wrote seven penitent psalms to God saying, God, please come back. Please come near again. I cast you off. Please come back. And so he wrote ten penitent psalms uh, for that reason. They don't have that big clock up there, so I'm almost done. I remember, um, he was, uh, I considered it the pinnacle of the world. My father owned a nightclub. It was rolling. People would come in at 8 o'clock when the doors open. They had to sh you'd have to run them out at 2 o'clock in the morning. People just partying because the economy was doing so well. And we were up till 5 o'clock in the morning counting all the money and make the deposit for the next day. And of course, along with that type of living, we were drinking our rum and cokes through the whole night, crowsing and just thought we really had it. I was only 16 years old and I shacked up with a barmaid. I was on top of the world. I had friends from everywhere. They had the best drugs and the best smoke and the best crack. They had it all. I was on the pinnacle according to the world. But I tell you, that moment 
is when it all crashed. Because the world offers a counterfeit pleasure that is doomed. And it just falls and crumbles and you go down with it. Your family goes down with it. Your relationships go down. Everything is just wiped out and you thought you had it. My friend said, how many bars does your father have? I said, he has three in his nightclub. And I've tried every mixed drink from every bar. Wow! Splash. Then, Ashes from putrid, ugly smelling addiction. God said, Come on, I'm here. He heard me the night that I thought my father was going to die. He said, I hear you. Come on. Doors open for the gospel from an elder in a church. Oh, just out of the blue, call me on the phone. And all I said was, God, I will find you. I'll find you. And that's what he'll do. So today, as the big band comes up, as the men go out for the offering, I don't think Scripture... Uh, I think the Bible is very clear this morning through James. Draw near to God or draw near to you. That means salvation too. Matter of fact, that is the goal. That is the purpose for drawing near to God. We realize, we humble ourselves and realize we're a sinner. It's not working. The world doesn't work. It's counterfeit. And God's calling me to Him to be near. When you come near to God, He has one thing in mind, your soul. Salvation. He wants to save you from this crooked and perverse world. It still is, isn't it? Even though Peter, Peter preached that 2,000 years ago, it's still perverse, isn't it? And he says, be saved from it. And so as we pray for the offering, because we owe God, don't we? We owe Him. But as we pray over the offering, and you have a decision to make this morning that you want to get out of this world <laughs> and into Christ, this is an opportunity here. Pray with me. Father, we do thank you that you are a God who is near to us. That you're not aloof and far off. You're not counting money and building an empire. You're counting souls and filling your church. And Father, with that, you said to submit to you. A part of submission is being humble. Trusting you, Father, with all that we have because none of it's ours. It's all on loan. And so, Father, with that said, I pray you'd bless, Lord, the hands that have worked for the offering that's taken up today. And if, Father, we would realize we can't outgive you and uh, we can't outlove you. And so, for that reason, Father, as we give, would you uh, bless the offering and the giver, a prosper, seven Christian church that we may draw others through you, uh, to your holy goodness. This is my prayer in Christ's name.